Uh, hello, everybody. I always sort of dread being the community representative at the end of these panels because I worry that people are thinking, oh, here comes the Debbie Downer to come along and tell us what we can't do. Um, but uh, I'd like to uh, say that um, uh, I think the, the, the move towards uh, more sort of universal kind of um, uh, larger testing programs and uh, setting ambitious targets for the treatment of people with HIV and, uh, and uh, trying to go ambitiously to, uh, for uh, reducing the proportion of people um, with HIV um, uh, who are infectious is uh, an admirable aim um, and I think that we need to be careful as HIV community activists not to act as a conservative force for blocking that while at the same time um, uh, using our own uh, expert knowledge as community members to point out the possible uh, barriers and dangers inherent in such an approach. Um, um, I was looking for a hook to uh, do this little talk, to hang this little talk on, and it was provided for me by the plane, um, by my journey over here, because I found myself watching Dallas Buyers Club for the first time. Um, a film I found very moving and also kind of uh, very nostalgic, um, I, in the sense that I myself was, for instance, involved in the early community, in the early randomised trials of high dose AZT monotherapy. Um, and, um, uh, but it also is a film with an interesting tension in the middle of it is that uh, it, it doesn't have a simple line on HIV treatment. Um, our um, hero uh, here um, is at one and the same time um, resisting um, uh, um, attempts by his physicians to get him to go on to a clinical trial of AZT while at the same time also trying to get hold of uh, unlicensed drugs, some of which are shown to be actually uh, more of a danger to him than a help. Um, and so there's always been a tension in the history of HIV between concern about the enforcement of treatment and of other measures and concern about withholding it. And I think that's now transferred to discussions about uh, TASP. There is, it's not a simple discussion. There's always been a tension there. Uh, maybe this is partially because the healthcare professionals with their sort of Hippocratic background um, uh, may um, see uh, their responsibility to patients uh, um, increasing as the patient's situation becomes more and more sort of urgent in terms of a healthcare response. And this, of course, could also apply to public health, whereas, in fact, there's always, you know, what the actual sort of legal system says is that uh, there is always a, an, a balance, as it were, of, 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 of power between, or should be, between uh, physicians and patients. <coughs> Um, we do have a tremendously more opportunities in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of how we can prevent HIV and also the evidence that we have that shows us how we can do it, obviously. Um, uh, oh, in, since the last 10 years, we've, we've gained vastly more kind of scientific information about um, the actual known efficacy of certain HIV prevention methods. This is, this is a kind of naughty slide. It sort of mixes up things like randomized control trials and sort of population effects and things like that. But it's basically a kind of attempt to sort of squash together all the significant scientific evidence we have about the efficacy of different, uh, different methods. And of course, the purple bars at the, uh, at the right are um, the, the treatment as prevention and uh, PMTCT interventions, and yes, they are the most effective. Um, the other point about this is that the red bars are the different uh, uh, observed and calculated efficacies of PrEP, showing that you can have a, a, an intervention that's potentially extremely efficacious, but that its actual effectiveness may be anything from zero to 100% according to um, um, the situation in which it's implemented. Implemented. And certainly there have been increased concerns about the targeting of various members of the HIV positive population or the HIV vulnerable populations in the last um, year. Um, I mean, uh, uh, there have been, uh, 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 there has been alarm about um, uh, sort of unconsidered recommendations perhaps for universal testing. I, I, I don't, the other, there's been targeting of uh, women uh, perceived to be HIV positive in Greece, MSM obviously in Africa. We know about that and of course at the same time we still you know we, we still need uh, to implement uh, uh, access in a lot of countries for basic treatment um, uh, 
and this does have public health impact. Um, the bottom uh, left uh, quote I like because it's from a study specifically of um, African MSM. Um, and, and it's, you know, this is not a young uh, gay man who's being, per MSM who's being persecuted, but it's somebody who simply goes to his clinic and gets a hostile reaction from a, from a healthcare worker. Uh, they are like, yeah, this is why you are having HIV. This is why. And they will be throwing words at you. So then you'll get embarrassed. You'll decide to leave without being treated and where are you taking that sickness to? That's what we're really talking about in terms of protecting the rights of people who are in any way involved in HIV testing and treatment. Uh, and of course, um, uh, the, 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 the motivating factors uh, that may um, uh, encourage or deter people to take HIV treatment are as idiosyncratic and contradictory as people are. Um, doctors may worry about kind of tests and clinical indicators, and uh, indeed they may worry about public health, and they may even worry about the behaviour of their patients. Um, but they don't. Uh, they they're not the ones taking the pills, of course although that's not to say that some doctors aren't patients too. Um, uh, and, they, and, they may, and patients may have completely contradictory motivations for wishing to take or not to take. I'm not going to read through this whole list. You can read some of them yourself. Um, but uh, patients may have the same background situation but come to completely opposite conclusions about um, how easy it is going to be for them to take antiretroviral therapy. Um, and certainly kind of uh, there have been reservations expressed within the community about the use of treatment for prevention purposes and these have a huge uh, range of different uh, degrees of understanding and credibility of the, of the situation I think. Um, I think there is a, a very large historical backlog of perception about antiretroviral therapy when I talk to people who are not particularly um, uh, up with the science, and that includes, you know, HIV positive people still take already on therapy, but it also it certainly includes people within the community who are, um, when you talk to them about getting more people on drugs, I think there is a perception that HIV drugs are still toxic. Um, are people, the, the legacy of things like um, D4T um, lipoatrophy is long. People still have that image of people kind of with the the the. the the, the facial uh, wasting in front of them. Um, and I think um, there needs to be a, a big sort of education effort um, to try and uh, correct that perception. Um, uh, I think that there's been a huge debate since the partner study results came out at Croy. Um, uh, and there is still a sort of a certain resistance to the idea that uh, HIV um, treatment really can reduce infectiousness to the significant degree that it's shown to. Um, people are worried about the impact of STIs, uh, if people, if, if uh, treatments prevention further accelerates um, the um, decline in condom use, uh, which of course it may not do. Um, uh, more uh, and more sort of personal perceptions of, of what it means to take antiretroviral therapy under the perception of art. This is a quotation from um, a study of uh, Kenyan attitudes towards AIT, and, and, and again, this is a historical legacy. People are still have in their minds the idea that AIT is something you take as a last resort. Um, and some more sort of, uh, sort of as you might, principled um, stands on this. One saying there's no precedent outside the criminal justice system where individuals are given drugs for purposes other than direct benefit. And medications were not introduced to allow men of either status more condom-free sex. They were introduced to save lives. I don't have anything to say about those other than people do have those kinds of, of attitudes. And so I think there are contradictory concerns about TASP. Will using its prevention deprive others who need it as treatment, or on the contrary, will, it, uh, will not using it as prevention deprive some who wish to protect their partners? Will test and treat programs violate human rights? Will failing to mobilize them violate human rights? Um, so, a bunch of us felt that it was time to try and write a kind of set of basic standards 
um, which were going to be a very broad set of standards that a wide range of people could agree to, which would underpin um, and be a something you could refer to when you were doing a when you were mobilising a, um, a treatment and as prevention program. And of course, there's a history of these things. Uh, the Denver principles from 1983, way back when, that said we are not victims of HIV, we are participants in the struggle to end HIV. Um, the even earlier one about how to have safe, the, 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 the leaflet that initiated the idea of safer sex and defined it, uh, and going on to a later development such as the positive health, dignity and prevention framework. And so we decided to write one, and this is the, in the preface. It said this is a community consensus statement on the use of ART for people living with HIV to reduce their risk of transmitting it. It's issued with an underlying principle in mind, that of safeguarding people's choices and well-being whether they choose to take ART or not. Okay. And it covers evidence, adherence, readiness, advantages, disadvantages, access and supply of drugs. Uh, the challenge TAS may have to previously accepted norms and the support and education needs of HIV positive and HIV negative people. Unanswered questions and research needs we put into an appendix because we realise that that's something that can change much more quickly as scientific evidence comes along. So it took a year to get together this thing. Um, it was an initi initiative of, of, of two players who were kind of relatively regional. I mean, I work for NAM, which is a global health um, uh, HIV information website, but we're not sort of, we don't have the sort of global penetration of a, of a, of a, of a community representative organization, delegate organization like the UMP Plus. And EATG, who are the other partners, are the European treatment uh, um, activist organization. Um, but we recognised that we were sort of coming at it, uh, this initiative was coming from a specific part of the HIV world and so uh, we're ambitious about the document but we don't expect it to be sort of uh, um, uh, automatically adopted. We want the people to look at it critically to, uh, before, but also uh, to, to use this as something that they can agree to sign on. So it took about a year to get together all together. Uh, went through I think 24 different drafts uh, and um, uh, was subject to public consultation, a community meeting we had before the IAPAC summit in London in September, and we finally launched it at the end of um, February. The, we, the community meeting was largely, again, attended by European representatives, um, but entirely due to resource constraints, um, but we did have reasonable representation from uh, a number of different affected communities and um, representatives from groups outside Europe. And it's come out in a number of different formats. The sign-on version, the one that's agreed, is a sort of six introductory clauses and 24 statement clauses that you can stick on three sides of paper, basically. Um, so, um, but also we boiled it down to sort of 15 key points. Um, and there is also a much more complete referenced version with the appendices that cover the efficacy of tests, because people want to know about that, which we're already going to have to change, given the partner study and unmet research needs. These are the key points. The aim of this statement is to safeguard the health and well-being of all people with HIV and their freedom and power to take or not to take HIV treatment. I'm not going to read through all these because I don't have time. Um, um, but pointing out the advantages of TASP, um, it can potentially free people with HIV from a huge burden of guilt, blame and anxiety about infection and others, infecting others. And that's one thing I think we've not done in enough research into, qualitative or quantitative, about um, the advantages of treatment as prevention as seen by the individual. Um, so uh, it has public health impact. Um, it's a benefit, not a responsibility. Um, the individual patient doesn't have a responsibility to take ART, except possibly to their partner, but that's a different discussion. Um, but not to the not to the body not to the public health uh, necessarily. Um, taking ART is a decision most people need time to consider. Most people. You know, there was a study that uh, came, uh, that, people, that, that, that we talked about yesterday, which was about treating people in acute infection. And sometimes, you know, the person may, may say, okay, yes, give me the drugs now, that's fine. But people need to be allowed uh, the possibility of time to consider it. And we don't want compulsory testing and compulsory art. It has to be done with collaboration with the patients. Shouldn't stop people who need it for treatment getting it. 
uh, in many places people who most need art have the worst access to it and all these sorts of considerations so this is the sort of 15 main points there okay um, and uh, this is the next steps. It's now outlined at uh, HIV treatment for Pareb, T4P.org. It's currently endorsed by, and this is two days ago, we have a clicker, 312 organizations and individuals, there may be more now. Um, it's part of a report on the IPAC summit in uh, communicable infectious diseases. Um, we want advocacy to incorporate the statement into other guidelines. I'm sorry I did, didn't have time to include his slide, uh, but my colleague Edwin Bernard has a poster, it's the first poster you see when you go into the breakfast room, uh, about the IAS guidelines um, which are being developed, which look from the wording remarkably similar to the ones we've done. And So we should avoid reinventing the wheel and I think talk about consolidating the two steps of guidelines. We have a satellite planned on it at Melbourne, and there is an abstract plan for Cape Town. And thank you very much. And there's the page if you sign up to it.